Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, today uh, at another session of Fireside Chat. Uh, I'm Marzia. I'm uh, a research scientist at uh, Cohere for AI. Uh, my background is in NLP. I'm based in uh, Amsterdam. I did my PhD here. I was just talking to Mirella and telling her that my first paper during my PhD was based on one of her papers. I'm very excited to have her uh, here today with us and talk about uh, a lot of interesting and, and exciting stuff. Uh, so just a uh, very brief uh, uh, introduction of uh, Mirella here today. Uh, she is a distinguished computer scientist and professor in the School of Informatics at the University of Edinburgh. And she is renowned for her groundbreaking contribution to the field of NLP and cognitive models. Uh, her uh, background, her master is from uh, Carnegie Mellon University and a doctorate from the University of Edinburgh. And throughout her career, spanning positions at Saarland University and the University of Sheffield, uh, before joining Edinburgh, she has significantly advanced the field, uh, in particular in cognitive models and semantic space. She has been recognized with prestigious awards such as Microsoft British Computer Society, uh, Karen Spark Jones Award, and elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. So very happy to have you here today. Thank you, happy to be here. Uh, great, so I had a very just like a, a, a summary of your career, but I do wanna hear about you uh from you about your career journey what uh, led you to actually uh, uh do essentially taking all of these steps in your career what made you interested in uh, linguistics and nlp in the first place yeah that, that's an interesting question so um when i was starting nobody could predict that nlp would be something that everybody understands and knows and it's hyped and sexy and there's something called generative AI and it's the future and whatnot. So uh, uh, when I did computer science, uh, science, I found it a bit a tad boring at the time because, you know, you would do all the, you would do the algorithm stuff and there was a lot of proofs, you know, proof by induction. And I, I found, I mean, I did the stuff, but I didn't find it very exciting and uh, we had some electives and one of these electives was machine learning when i was doing my undergraduate and i thought oh wow data and another one was linguistics and so you know data and linguistics um i thought okay that's something i can do with this degree which is otherwise a bit uh, let's say um dry and uh, then uh, when I was very lucky that I went to CMU because it was at the time when NLP, uh, you know, NLP, the popularity um, and the shifts in the field come in waves. So first there was what they called computational linguistics, which was before my time where people would write prologue programs and they would try to deal with ambiguity and ambiguity was a big deal. And how can we deal with ambiguity? Because you would write, um, a parser and the parser would have like 500 interpretations for a seemingly not very ambiguous sentence. Anyway, so there was that. And then when I went to CMU, it was statistical NLP where we were doing counting and uh, people have discovered corpora and the pen tree bank. And this was like very formative because, oh, and there was the first language models. And these were our frequentist language models where you would go and count things. And then uh, once you've counted things, we, we had to do discounting and smoothing and all. So I learned all of that there. And it was like amazing and eye-opening experience experience and uh, then I never looked back that's a, like a short summary of uh, and now now it's like another amazing time I mean there's difficulties but I think it's uh, this is our time and we should take advantage of it and uh, the future is great yeah uh, that, that sounds great I, I do feel similar like when I also started doing NLP it was not really I guess like up until like a few years ago, it wasn't really like the, the hottest topic of exactly. uh, science. So it's it's really nice to see that. I actually really liked what you mentioned about these waves in NLP, like the, there has been a few waves. And what are your thoughts in general about uh, navigating a field that or can be any field that comes in these sorts of waves? Yes. Uh, so... Uh... 
if you are an academic, uh, this is your life, which means that you have to adapt this, or create these these waves, right? There, there are some people like Benjo and uh, these uh, Turing Award winners, uh, Lecun and uh, oh God, Jeff, Jeff Hinton. Okay, so they created the waves, <laughs> they created the waves, and now we are riding the waves. So that's okay. But uh, as mere mortals, we have to adapt or at least uh, whatever, see the waves and ride them. Um, so, and this can be very rewarding, but it's also kind of uh, difficult because you have to forget what you know, or at least relearn things. I personally find it quite interesting. And as a person, I get easily bored. Uh, so um, excitement and, uh, you know, new things uh, I find quite uh, good. Uh, it keeps you sort of on your toes. Now, having said that, I think that we are sort of at an inflection point nowadays with these large language models and generative AI. And um, the space is a bit harder to navigate. And of course, students have a huge angst. Do you think that my topic will be relevant next year? Oh, will NLP be as... And I don't share any of the anxiety, but uh, I have to mitigate it and I have to have solutions against it. But I think waves are in general a positive thing. NLP is an ever evolving field. Uh, it's not stagnant. There's other fields like nothing ever happens. It's the same thing year after year. Um, anyway, this is my my feeling. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great advice, uh, especially for people who newcomers to the field who uh, uh, might be a bit intimidated with what's going on. Uh, so really nice advice. Uh, I do also want to hear if you can think about uh, during your career, especially early on in your career, if you also got any advice that really shaped your career. Can you think about like any any influential uh, person? Uh, that, at point? that is very uh, interesting. Uh, whether I got any uh, advice, uh, so. Uh, <laughs> um, you have to understand that when I was doing my PhD, it was almost the Wild West in the sense that uh, nowadays, I think that you get these students that um, have very sort of um, uh, a path. They have a plan in their head what they want to do. So they go like, and I did not have, I'm, I'm just going to draw this student nowadays in, in contrast to what I did. Uh, so they say, okay, I'm going to do a PhD with advisor XYZ in university XYZ, and I will pick the university because they have the most GPUs, let's say, and then I will write five papers, five papers with my advisor, three with uh, eminent people in the field, I will do two internships, and by the time I am like, I don't know, 28, I will be a millionaire. Let's say this is a hypothetical person with a plan, you had, you had planning in your title. Now, when I started, we didn't have, none of this was, uh, was there. Uh, there were some people that uh, were amazing, like Martha Palmer, for example. I remember meeting her uh, at a conference. She was the Lifetime Award winner at uh, ACL, and she came to me. He said, oh, do whatever you like. You're going to be fine. So imbued with enthusiasm and, and goodwill, uh, and I, I found her whole attitude uh, very refreshing. So, you know, she said, do whatever, it'll be great. You just have to try out things. Um, uh, there was one uh, person who I don't know, and none of you will know, his name is called Mark Light. And he uh, did not have any impact, like any sort of groundbreaking. But I remember I was like just starting out. Just, and I had a chat with him, he visited the university. And I was literally, I hadn't written any papers. And he sat and said to me, the first thing you need to think about before you even think of the problem is how to evaluate. If you don't have that, you have nothing. And this has stayed with me up to today. That uh, and, and we, as a field, we don't know about evaluation that much. I mean, we know we evaluate, but we haven't worked out. And our evaluation is even worse than before because everybody evaluates in their own way and there's no metrics and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so um, and a third person that I still to this day I look up to is Mark Stidman. He's a colleague here. and. Whatever Mark says, I agree with, and uh, whenever I have a question, I go to him, and uh, it's uh, very good. Yeah, that's really, uh, really nice, and also very 
still relevant. I love that there's like probably there, there's some context about like how, how you want to evaluate like at that time uh, to think about that, but it's not really, uh, it's still very relevant and very important, the question of. Actually evaluate. more important now because um, these models are seemingly very good, uh, but so you have to be smarter in your evaluation. The metrics uh, are automatic, but everybody uses like whatever that comes into their head. And we don't actually as a community have standard metrics unless you're evaluating accuracy or F1 or, you know, numeric. But the tasks now are not like that. They've become a bit more sophisticated too. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe on, on that topic, I would love to hear more about just what do you think would be uh going forward with especially with closed models that we don't know like the data also that goes into them whether there is contamination or not how like what would be like a tr truly reliable way of evaluating these models what what is still missing that you think researchers should be working on that is a very good question so um even so we have the closed models like gpt i don't know now or claude whatever so and we have like this seemingly uh, open source models like Lama or Mistral, which are not really that open source. I mean, you can update the weights, but you don't actually know what it, they have been trained on. And this is, uh, I personally find very problematic. I also do not think we, we can evaluate the models. We can say ChatGPT or Claude or whatever, or, the, or here models do X, Y, Z. But that to me, and I, I say this in the nicest possible way, is not interesting. Interesting. I don't care to find out what they can or cannot do, they cannot do unless somebody can tell me why. And the why we cannot actually know without having the full picture. And the full picture means you need to know what is trained on, you need to know about the alignment, how much data has it seen, what sort of RL did you use, and you know, what, did you use demonstrations? What were the demonstrations? So uh, my answer would be, we cannot really truly know what these models can do and cannot, well, we can know, but we cannot explain. So there is two paths forward. One is to say, this is the, st the state, this is how things are. And so the best we can do is actually, uh, you know, uh, do model editing, edit the model and observe. So people do these things, you know, they, they, they make it forget and then they see what sort of abilities you lose or you don't lose or maybe can generalize. Uh, or um, we just use uh, smaller models and do simulations. Or maybe people now will adopt Olmo because Olmo is like we know what it's been trained on. So it is problematic and highly, if you like are a scientist and you want to ask questions and I want to find out answers, uh, it's not good enough to know like you, and we cannot run experiments like, you know, removes part of the data, see what it happens, particularly with instruction tuning. I think this is quite important. Um, anyway, yeah. so. I, I completely agree. I think these are all very good points. I, I, I think it might be, we need probably like a big shift and change as a field, but it's probably, uh, yeah, it's not going to be easy to, uh, uh, I mean, it's really nice that there are advocates for open source models. So I would say that. So hopefully we will see more. more hopefully we'll see more, but also you are absolutely right. And this is the problem as a field we need to adopt the open source models we need to be like i think the community should say um so reviewers so everybody should say we use the open source models and in fact somehow closed source models should be discouraged or at least you know the, the reviewer that says have you compared to gpt should not exist because mm -hmm. the reviewer should first ask do i have money to pay to compare to ChatGPT, you you see this is uh, yeah yeah no that's uh, that's a very good point yeah uh, yeah and so you you did actually mention about um, the data and like how these models like the the importance of knowing the data that was used for these models uh, for training of these models and I know during your career you have been working on building and releasing a lot of different resources. Uh, uh, 
like the wiki catsum, the xwiki's data set, all of these data sets. Uh, why do you think it's actually important building and releasing these data sets uh, in your opinion? Now, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> well, I would pose it differently. Was it important or has it been? So um, I think it is important to benchmark progress. And we cannot benchmark progress without data sets. So uh, this wiki got some and X wikis and whatnot. I think some of these data sets actually are part of leaderboards like the GEM benchmark. And this is important because uh, without uh, being able to test uh, abilities of these models and these data sets, uh, we would not be able to like track progress and go beyond what we can achieve and whatnot. So releasing data sets is important. Now, every data set has issues. In particular, since uh, we've moved from, I mentioned the Penn Dream Bank, when I was at CMU, everybody was working with the Penn Dream Bank, which took years to make. It is, uh, you know, experts, the manual, I think, at the time was more than 50 pages, maybe 100 pages. I don't remember now. We can look up the manual. It's, you can find it. So now we've moved from this highly sophisticated, very carefully curated data sets to data sets like X wikis, which is synthetically created. You have like the Wikipedia uh, page and you make assumptions like the first paragraph is the summary and then you align it somehow in a dirty way to other um, summaries in other languages and you create a data set. So this data set is not as perfect as the pantry bank. So um, as long as we acknowledge the difficulties with and you have, we have to have large scale data sets and this is again problematic. So I have nothing against data sets. They're important and interesting, but and I, I am guilty, guilty, the first person to be guilty. We create too many data sets. I don't know that everybody uses those data sets. And then if I see where these, uh, the, the benchmarks for these language models, there is a heavy bias towards question answering. There is very few summarization or other generation tasks. And yeah, uh, th there is an imbalance there. Yeah, that's a uh, very interesting point. Like, why do you think that is like our generative tasks are just like harder to evaluate harder, because harder, yeah. yeah hard to do. evaluate and you need to have like um, i also think that the the different generative tasks in the long run will require different types of evaluation if you have like a dialogue for example and you generate whatever and you talk with a language model you cannot just do blue this makes no sense and i'm sure that community has developed you would have to say like task completion uh, how long it took so there have to be other metrics and then if you're doing summarization, you cannot use Rouge today. Rouge, I mean, there have been all these studies last year that say that, you know, it doesn't correlate with human judgments. And yes, correlation is 0.1, and maybe we should use other metrics. So suddenly, the metric that we are optimizing is no longer valid. So we'd have to have another metric. And then let's take another generation task. I don't know. Um, let's say cross-lingual summarization. There would have to have like some machine translation metric as well, because you're doing machine, machine translation. So suddenly with generation, it's not clear question answering where you ask a question and you get the answer and it's harder. Mm. We'll get there. I mean, these are all steps that we will have to, um, to do. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. The importance of then building the data sets for these kinds of generative, uh, uh, tasks are because at some point we should be uh, maybe yeah at some point yes heavily. yes yes yeah okay yeah that that's definitely uh, yeah uh, I agree and I I also wanted just like a curiosity fun question if you had no uh, limitations and had all resources what would be the data set that you want to create like what is in your mind like a Great okay. of Oracle data set. That is a good uh, question. Uh, so uh, you are not talking about like pre-training a large language model. If I had like, if I have, yeah. So I think uh, a data set that would be very useful and it's very difficult to do and it would help would be uh, some data set where a human 
is interacting with the language model and i'll explain so we all play with these things right we ask questions we get whatever okay but if we are going to take these models in the future and uh, integrate them in our day-to-day -day lives right and they're not that integrated right now because you know you can use uh, a language model to paraphrase a sentence, but you cannot really ask it to draft emails if they're important or whatever. Like, you know, th th there is a threshold. So because the field is moving towards more interactive tasks, uh, we need to be able to model that interaction of a user with the model. And that is a very difficult task. So where one user has a session and has a tasks and, and, and the task like it's trying to do collaboratively with the language model. I don't know how to obtain data for this data set. I don't know what the tasks would be. I mean, this would have to be designed properly. You would have to have the same human over and over again. But whoever creates this, this data set that we can model the interaction and then we can actually improve the models. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that, but it has to be interactive. It has to be interactive and also break down at some point if it ever breaks down and um, all of that. And for different tasks, like I do summarization, somebody else does chatbots, another person does a multi-model thing, a fourth person does code, and yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that would be great. And I don't think currently we have any close, close. We don't have it. We have like um, a prompt, output prompt output yeah but yeah like probably like some user feedback but not really also like thinking about uh the like the intent of the user like th these are not things that we we know currently absolutely right what am i trying to achieve am i trying to cheat in my exam or am i trying to do something else like summarize like a 500 uh, page document yeah Mm, yeah, nice. Uh, well, let's hope at some point we we can actually build such a data set. It would be uh, really nice to have. Uh, so I do actually want to also talk a little bit about your general uh, research uh, area on uh, uh, essentially adding planning to, to the model. So I, I have... Uh, Notice that, and I think it uh, comes uh, from uh, your interest in just like uh, enabling computers to understand requests. And I've seen uh, the so you had done some work that uh, you essentially do this planning via a sequence of questions in a long form question answering uh, problem. You also do that in as a sequence of entities that capture the the content of a summary in a cross-lingual summarization task. So, like different, I I love that like the tasks are different. How you uh, uh, define this like planning is also different, but the essence is the same. So, trying to provide the models with just like having some sort of like a plan essentially. Like, uh, so what are your thoughts there? Like, what is really missing in these models like how like uh, why you are uh, doing uh... yes yes these are all good questions so um so okay so you're absolutely right uh, the plan itself doesn't really matter that much so you can uh, represent it in different ways but the main point is that uh, you have to have a plan so uh, i'll explain why i think planning i mean planning is the future and a lot of people are doing it but they don't call it planning so right now what happens is you have a request and then you, the model gives you some output and it's like a block of text and you don't understand what made the model actually produce this block of text so at the minimum requirement is you want to know the thought process of the model and therefore, if you had a plan as an intermediate stage, it could tell you that, you know, first of all, I'm going to explain why, for example, I don't know, vegetarian food is good, then I'm going to talk about uh, types of vegetarian food, and then I will tell you uh, what benefits it is for men and women in their health or whatever. Um, so if anything, if you don't want to do anything, at least the plan will give you some explanation behind the workings of the model because the models are black boxes. Now, 
I, aside from that, if we talk about long form generation, long form means you extend beyond a simple paragraph. Let's say I want to generate a, I don't know, an essay or some chapters in a book. Are we seriously saying that we can trust this model to actually produce, I don't know, 2000 word text without a plan? Would you do that? I mean, I see my kids how they write. First, they tell them at the school. So first you have to do a plan. And the, the, the plan, the plan, they don't call it plan. They, they, call, they, they do like these bubbles with the characters, how many characters you have, what do they do? What are their actions? So we humans, I mean, JK Rowling really sat there and wrote eight books in one go. Who believes that? So, okay, so there is, there is many computational reasons why you want to break down this process. Um, because you control it, because you can explain it, because the model has to do a simpler task. Uh, and also, uh, there are a sort of logistic, re if ultimately we want to produce this very long document, how are we going to do it? And I said, like other people do it. So now this chain of thought prompting, uh, if you look at the paper, it has, I don't know how many citations, and it just appeared last year. Chain of thought is really, they don't mention planning, I don't know why, but it is the model planning what to do next. So um, it's not a sort of top-down plan. You can have a plan and then given this plan generate, but it does it step by step. So this is a decomposition of the problem and they have a plan which is like kind of simple in their scenarios because they're doing question answering but still they're doing it and this has become like a cottage industry now with a tree of prompts and um, there is lots of variants of this very basic idea i'm saying okay for question answering maybe you don't strictly speaking need a plan even though they show that you know the model can the, in particular the language language model can do it better but definitely uh, it makes sense to me uh, to decompose the problem into smaller components and you can have plans for other things like for multimodal problems it also makes sense to me uh, for understanding also you know when we decompose the input there's this big deal about models understanding long context well uh, maybe you can break it down and you have a plan as to how you break down the input and then you know process it piecemeal all of these things of course increase inference or, or computation i should say if you break down the plan uh, then and you plan like piece by piece and you have like one model that does chapter one and another one that does chapter two and then a third one that aggregates them so this increases inference so i guess Maybe this approach might not be very popular if you if latency is an issue and you have to be fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a that's a very good point. And I was wondering, so what are your thoughts in general? Do you think there should be uh, like a task agnostic or like objective agnostic plan that we we have to incorporate in the, the architecture of these models, or do you think it's really dependent on like what we want to achieve and that's a brilliant question that's a brilliant question and i've thought about this i thought about this so ideally you would like to i ideally you want the plan to be learned somehow and uh, to be general and you want to have a method of decomposing things that is task agnostic but even with the chain of thought i mean it's very specific to the task however so if we could do that that would be great i am skeptical as to whether this can be done uh, in practice because different generation problems would necessitate different plans like if you plan a story versus an essay the plans are different or if i plan to write let's say a report or something on the other hand maybe you can have a high level uh, organization and then uh, which is very general and very broad and then you can have more specialized things that hang off it or a hierarchical approach um yeah it is it is a research question actually mm. Mm. how to uh, do this yeah yeah uh and uh i also wanted to see what are your thoughts about 
what are some good tasks to actually expose the flaws, like expose the need for planning for these models? So you said maybe like something like a regular question answering where the answer is in the passage is not really, uh, but what what would be in your mind, like some interesting task out there or like something that should be designed to expose this uh, need? I think you may even argue that uh, summarization is not a good test bed for planning, even though, you know, there is work showing that the plans help you generate uh, better summaries. So I would say anything that is beyond two or three paragraphs uh, is a good uh, is a good example. I would love to be able to actually show this with generate like if you want to write a paper and there is a field uh, there that does LLMs for science. So if you if you have an LLM actually write a scientific paper where um, not even not even the paper, let's say the introduction. So you give it the references and you say here are the references. These are the, the things that I want to cite. Write the introduction. The introduction is not very long, but this is a very difficult task. The current LLMs cannot do it. And of course, you need a plan to say, you know, first I will explain what the problem is, then I will talk about approach A, then about approach B. So this would be an example where that you couldn't do. And then we go to the paper. Of course, you have to have a plan for the paper. And these days we read a lot of papers without plans. So uh, yeah, there is hope for the models actually. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sounds good. Uh, so we, we did talk about how uh, to incorporate planning for these models. And I do also want to ask you, how do you plan your research projects in general? Like how, uh, uh, how do you build your uh, uh, portfolio of research of working on uh, these many yes. different? That is an interesting question. So uh, I have I have a plan in how I do this, but maybe it's uh, old fashioned or stupid, and I'll explain what I mean. So um, there are some tasks that I so it's it's there is these people who are method driven. So you will have a method, you will have like a a, a method, and you will apply it everywhere. I. I'm not that kind of person. I'm more like, you know, there is these tasks that I like and I want to solve the tasks. So we will use methods that make sense for the task. So my, my first sort of research question is, why is the task interesting? How can we do this? And then I will go and try to find the method that is uh, suited to the task. Having said that, I have some sort of uh, favorites. So uh, of course, generation is a favorite. Uh, Nowadays, I'm quite interested in how you can deal with very long input or very long output. I also like multi-model tasks and in particular things that have to do with movies and uh, generating summaries for movies or processing the movies, generating trailers. Anyway, multi-modality uh, in the generation domain uh, or also in the representation space. Um, yeah, this, this is how I do this. And of course, my tastes also change with the times and uh, adapt. Mm. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, and uh, I also wanted to ask you if you can share with us uh, uh, some uh, or like one of your uh, uh, the challenges that you had to overcome in your career. So uh, a period or a thing or like something and uh, something that you can share uh, how how you overcome a challenge. Uh, you mean a, a research challenge? Uh, well, right? actually, that's a good question. Both maybe like just like research challenge, but also in general, like if there is uh, something that, uh, yeah, at some point, maybe you had to fight against something or just like uh try yeah, to I have a good story it's a recent story and i hate that story but i can share it to you so um uh, so you know here if you are in an academic environment uh, you have to teach you have to do a lot of things and so your time is like taken up by uh, lots of things you have to multitask and um, so um we all 
in the in the UK and I think in Europe there is like these funding initiatives where you can apply for fellowships and what the fellowships do and I, I know people will think oh poor her but uh, this was very traumatic for me so I'm sharing it so you apply for this fellowship and these fellowships are prestigious you can have them like for five years and what is good in my department which is wonderful at the University of Edinburgh they give you relief from teaching and you are supposed to concentrate only on okay only on research so there was this fellowship that i wanted to apply for i had my eye on it it was amazing so i applied many times for this the first time um i got uh, good reviews and they invited me for an interview and decided not to give me uh, the fellowship uh, the second time i did not get an interview the third time i changed it entirely it went to the wrong panel. I had to apply, to cut a long story short, four times. The fourth time I went to the interview and I got it finally. Uh, it was, I think, the last opportunity that I had to apply for this call. And I'm putting it out there. Everybody has difficulties. It's like fellowships, it is papers. I also take papers being rejected very personally, even though I understand at the back of my head that this is a system and it's a random process. And, you know, how can you take this personally? I lose sleep over, you know, reviewers' comments. Don't do that. In general, this is like an uphill battle and we have to pick ourselves up and continue and tomorrow is a better day, so to say. But yes, uh, this was very traumatic. But <laughs> what can you do? There is no other resource but to keep trying. So I guess my, my advice would be keep trying. You have not, if, if you don't try, you lose automatically. At least uh, if you try, you learn if you succeed or not. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I think that that's a uh, great uh, advice. And in general, just like there's always like out there people only sharing their success stories, like the accepted papers and the accepted yeah. uh, opportunities. So it's really great to hear, I, I think for everyone, uh, especially new researchers in the field that behind every success, there's also like a few failures. And there's few more failure than success. In, in everyone's life, we, we have to learn, and this is a thing now uh, at schools, it has become uh, a big thing to teach the kids resilience. So my children, like they had like sessions on end, how to become resilient. And I go like, okay, you cannot theorize about resilience, you have to live it. And I'm sorry to say you have to fail to be able to understand what it is to be resilient. And all of us have, uh, you know, these, these things are part of life. and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know who doesn't fail. You learn by failure and then you fail better. Churchill said this, I think, you, we, we, we fail better next time and next time till we at some point have a success. Mm. Yeah, uh, very true. Uh, and uh, maybe also on that topic, uh, what are some general advice that you would give to newcomers in research, especially the ones that think, they maybe don't have access to enough resources or the guidance, the type of guidance that they want. Uh, and uh, yeah, what, what would you tell Yeah, them? it is problematic, the resources. This is now we are becoming like this community where, um, you know, the rich can play and the poor can walk from the sides. This is quite problematic. Uh, my advice would be to, um, the environment, uh, it is the usual um, sort of rationalism versus empiricism, which is, you know, are we born with innate abilities or do we get them from the environment? And I'll, I'll explain the analogy. So if you are rich and you have access to resources, of course, you can play the game. But if you don't have resources, what, what do you do? Well, you are shaped by the environment and actually maybe it's an opportunity. If I don't have the money to like train, I don't know, burn down half a forest, maybe I can work on parameter efficient methods, maybe. So turn this around and make it an opportunity. Maybe I, I build a better chip, maybe I build a, a smaller model. So they should not be sort of uh, disheartened by the fact that they don't have access to resources. They should try to turn it around and, and, and something will come out of this. It's also the case that, you know, we as a community need to be more vocal about these inequalities. 
and I think they need to be addressed. And I wasn't kidding. They need to be addressed at the reviewing level. They need to be addressed at the association level, where we say, you know, we talk about inequality and about access to opportunities and and whatever. I don't see ACL doing. Maybe they do it. Actually, I don't. I don't know. Um, a, a workshop and for people who don't have access and give them their things to play and whatever. I don't, I don't see the organization of these things and we have to be more proactive. Yeah, uh, that's a very important point. So I, I, I do hope that we can, as a community of uh, just researchers, can do that for, especially for newcomers then to, to make their life a bit easier, I guess. I mean, imagine now you're a newcomer and you are not in an Ivy League school and you want to learn, and you can't. What what do they do? Yeah, uh, and, yeah. I that's... mean, it's not as bad. There is hugging face. They can just you know, as long as they can, they have enough memory, a little bit of memory with hugging face. Hugging face is great. I'm like absolutely huge service to the community. Yeah, I agree. And actually, you you did also mention something that is uh, very relevant to one of the the questions from our audience. So let me actually read that for you. Uh, uh, Somaya Navani asked, how would a beginner break into research on understanding how these models work, think, or reason? Let's say open source models like Mixtral. What would be a roadmap to follow as most professional positions need PhDs? So these are many questions. Um, so let me rephrase the question if I understand it correctly. So uh, the, the question is about trying to actually unpack uh, what these abilities are down to, right? Um, so the first thing uh, you should do is take a, an actually completely open source model. And uh, to my mind, there's maybe one or two of those not too huge so that you can run experiments uh, in a day not like in a month or whatever and then as assuming that the computational problem and it, one can run experiments is solved then the research starts and there it has to be directed by a research question so for the reasoning reasoning for example a valid question is where does reasoning ability how does reasoning ability come Okay, so this is a question that I don't think anybody has answered properly. Uh, does it emerge or is it down to having seen these examples in the data, right? If you have an open source model, you can manipulate this and answer the question. Uh, is it by instruction tuning? You can change the instruction tuning. So I think it has to be question driven and research driven. And first ask the question and then do the experiment rather than the other way around. I think we tend to run a lot as a community, many experiments and the questions get lost. And then in the end, it's like a sea of empirical results. I do not care so much about observations. I want to know what the observations are for. Yeah, uh, that sounds good. And uh, I think the maybe the, the second part of uh, their question, oh, uh, actually, no, they already posted a follow up. So maybe let me read, read that. Read the follow up, yes. What is uh, any advice on participating in interpretability research groups without a PhD? Would you say open source contributions are the best way to break in? Yes, definitely. Because open source, everybody can see and everybody can look at and everybody can, you can make a name with open source contributions. In general, I think open source as a community is the way to go. There is no, no question to my mind that uh, open source is winning on so many levels. I mean, it took us a year or two, but from now on, this is the only, if, if we want to survive as a community, right? And not be overtaken by this. Uh... Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that sounds great. So uh, I think, uh, great. So uh, Somaya also says, thanks. I do want to also ask you while more questions are coming in uh, about, so we, you uh, 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 talked about some advice for newcomers and researchers. I do also want to talk about on the other side of the coin, essentially. So for people 
who uh, want to uh, maybe early mentors or uh, because you uh, you play a crucial role in developing early stage researchers working with students and any advice that you have uh, for people who are now becoming like supervisors or want to help uh, new researchers yeah that's a I do not envy them. This is a, <laughs> like when starting out. So the first advice is do not try to do everything. Uh, pick one or two things that are closest to one's heart and try to develop this. I see it with new people, like they do so many things. And then you don't understand what it is that is the defining characteristic. Maybe this doesn't uh, matter anymore, but but I think as a young person going into a community, you have to sort of become an expert in something. And to become an expert in something, you have to actually really understand this. So I would rather go deep rather than broad. That would be my advice. Uh, yeah, really good advice. Thanks. Um, and actually, maybe also relevant to that. So there's a question from RY in chat about how can we ask good research questions? So maybe also as a new researcher, but also as like a new uh, mentor, how to come up with research questions? This is actually, yeah, this is a good question. And the, the students ask me a lot. Uh, I remember I had a student once and he came, he was very serious and he sat down and he said, okay, so we were talking about research and whatever. And he said, I have to ask you a question and it's really important. But like, okay, oh my God. And when you hear this, I think like, oh, what, what, what is he now? Is he going back home? Is he getting married, whatever? And oh, he has problems, I think like the worst. And so he said, how do you pick a research problem? <laughs> if only I knew how did that, okay. But there are some uh, heuristics that one can apply when picking a research problem. And I have to be honest, the first one is, are many people working on this? If many people are working on this, avoid, avoid, avoid. Um, is, second question uh, that one should uh, ask, does this uh, problem, research problem, mean anything to you? So if you are very passionate, for example, I had a student and this, this student came and said, I care about, you know, minority languages. This is a very good idea to do your research around what your passion is. If you care about interpretability, go for interpretability. If you care about, uh, I don't know, uh, models, language models that do not swear at people, like alignment. So you have to be passionate about the topic. And unfortunately, to my mind, you cannot do research without this passion. It has to speak to you, but it shouldn't be very, very, very popular. Like, you know, nowadays, some tasks are so congested that uh, it's not possible to do meaningful research. Uh, the other and the third, uh, so uh, does it speak to you? And the third thing is, is it ambitious enough? Because one gets uh, these two extremes, either the, pro the problem is pedestrian and it will be solved in six months and then what do you do? Uh, so for the junior researcher finishing a PhD, this has to be a research agenda. So usually planned for five years. And if your question is, you know, how can I make prompts better? This is not really a long scope question. If your question is, how can I get the agents to communicate? Maybe that's a better question because, you know, we cannot do this right now. So it has to be the right scope. It sh should have depth. It should not be very short term. And you should always have fun. If it's not fun, then don't do it. Sorry. Don't do it. Life is too short. Uh, yeah, I I agree. I always say uh, to people who ask me that you definitely have to love what you do, especially like PhD or research. Otherwise, there's like a lot of things that would discourage you. So it's really important to to be passionate about about that. Uh, thanks. So I think uh, RY. I hope that answers your question. Uh, and uh, one uh, last question that I actually have for you. So going back to the theme of this talk about planning. So I'm very cu curious, how do you usually plan your day-to-day -day work? So like, how, how does your day look like? And at your level, do you still code? Uh, how do you uh, work with your students? How does it look like? 
so I, uh, yeah, my day. Oh. So I uh, usually have some days without any meetings that I take for reading papers or for looking at people's code or for doing things that I need to do myself. Um, so now I need to actually understand how this MEM GPT works. I, I found out that there is this MEM GPT, never mind. And so I need to download it from Hugging Face and actually play with this. So I have to, to have time for this. Uh, so I plan and I leave some days, usually Monday and Tuesday are the best days for my me time. And then, of course, uh, I have one day where I do students. So this is Fridays usually, although there's some spillover effects. And then there's other meetings and whatever. But even when I'm busy, like I have one or two hours every day where I just think to myself, because if you don't think, if you don't read papers, if you don't, it's very difficult. Then, you know, you only rely on second hand information from what other people tell you and i quite like to form my own opinions uh, but you know the senior you get the more stuff you have and the more demands are on your time and um, the busier one gets but this is part of the job uh, for better or worse and uh, yeah yeah uh, thanks for sharing that i think it's really uh, these are the kind of things that we wouldn't normally know like how researchers like you work so uh, it's very interesting to uh, to to hear that uh, okay uh, great thanks a lot any last uh, comments anything that you want uh, the audience that people watch this video to take away uh, with them um i'm i'm not sure that i want them to take away anything other than uh you know do the best you can and uh, one has to have a positive attitude and a can do and will do attitude and good things come to those who persist yeah that's quite a, great, a lot great note like persistence in research that's very important uh, yeah, uh, great. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mirella, for joining me today. Uh, it was great chatting with you. And uh, thanks, everyone, who uh, attended this talk and for the questions. Uh, have a great day. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think, oh, no, there are no questions. Yeah, people are saying thanks and great advice. Okay, so, thank you very much for having me. A round thank of you. applause for you. Thank you. Have a good day. You bye. Too, bye. Oh, 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 oh,